Uh, my name is Jean Cook. I'm the director of programs for Future Music Coalition. It's my pleasure to introduce this next panel. Um, so this is openness versus enforcement. One of the hottest topics in technology policy right now is the online freedom of expression. It's clear that the ability to speak, engage, and organize is something that the internet has amplified globally. On the other hand, uh, there is the need to consider the rights of creators whose work fall under copyright law. Musicians and other creators depend on both free expression and the protection of that expression. Recent attempts to solve problems like commercial foreign websites that traffic in unauthorized American intellectual property were soundly defeated by a massive internet outcry that included artists and other copyright holders. One reason was that the Stop Online Piracy Act was deemed dangerous to expression. But is that the whole story? How do artists view these potentially competing concerns? Does the US government have a responsibility to fix things? And if so, what does that look like? We're happy to have with us today a panel that represents a range of viewpoints, all of them valid and informed. Please join us in welcoming musician and producer Aaron McKeown, David Sohn, who's the general counsel of the Center for Democracy and Technology. John Strom will be joining us um, virtually. He's the senior counsel for Loeb and Loeb LLP. He's going to be the virtual panelist from Nashville. And Maggie Vale is the co-executive director of Cash Music. Our moderator is Michael Bracey. <coughs> thank you, Jean. And um, thank you, uh, everybody, for coming. And, and John, are you there virtually? I, I am. Can you hear me? <laughs> that is so. <laughs> John Michael, I have to say I'm so bummed because I spent all this money on hair and makeup. And <laughs> Everyone on web can see you. Okay, so everybody watching in the web can see you and everybody oh, here okay. in the room can, Thank can God. hear Thank you. God. Okay. So. That's good. That's good. Um, before we start, I want to clarify one point um, from the last conversation just to make sure everybody knows. We have a whole panel coming up later today. Um, featuring Kurt Hansen and David Lowry and other representatives who are going to do nothing but wonk out for about 45 minutes about the specifics of the webcasting bill. So for those of you on Twitter who want more of that, it's coming. For those of you who want less of that, that's when you get lunch. But we can figure that out as we get into the day. So um, I am so happy to have you guys here. Um, thank you, panelists, for, for taking time and, and traveling in. I know everybody's incredibly busy. I think um, when we thought about how to architect this day and thought about the schedule, um, we thought this would be a really nice place to start in, in terms of trying to get some perspective on kind of the big questions and some of the big approaches. You know, one of the things we've talked about at Future Music Forever is the core concept that policy gets made by that those who show up. You know, that the only way you're going to um, have an impact in Washington, have an impact with the policy community, is by engaging with it. And from the standpoint of the artist community and music community more broadly, uh, the only way to fail is to just not try. And I think that one of the things that we saw last year with all the um, kind of uh, emotion and energy around um, first the PIPA debate and then it morphed into the SOPA PIPA debate um, was a lot of, uh, of really complicated feelings and emotions. Um, because I think when, when policy gets involved, I appreciate what, what Greg Cott said earlier that any time policymakers start thinking about music, that that's a red flag for him. Uh, that's not the way it is for Future Music Coalition. We actually like to see policymakers engage um, on an ongoing basis around issues that impact arts and culture. But I think the starting point is always, what is the problem you're trying to solve? And I think that, certainly from our standpoint, um, the very narrow questions about what do you do um, with overseas infringement, with um, companies that are essentially running fraudulent operations overseas that are setting up basically storefronts that feel like iTunes, look like iTunes, feel like you're, you know, you, you, you know, when my daughters put in their credit cards to download the record, they think they're doing something completely above board. And our government not feeling like we have anything in terms of legal authority to deal with that, that's a legitimate question. And, and it's an important question. And I think the issue is, as that debate kind of morphed and other questions started to be asked and um, real important issues surrounding the mechanics of legislation and what does legislation do and does the legislation actually match with what the goals are, you know, these are really important things and really important issues. And what we also recognize and, 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 and value is the fact that we've been doing this for a long time. You, this is our 11th summit. We've been around for 12 years as an organization. And we think broadly about the role that technology is playing, 
not only in terms of the industry and kind of the commercial aspects, but in terms of art and culture and speech and politics and all the different things that is happening, particularly overseas. And we're going to talk about Pussy Riot later today in terms of why Pussy Riot matters. But the role that technology is playing in terms of creating entirely new uh, ways of thinking about art, thinking about culture, thinking about expression. And um, it's exciting. Uh, at the same time, again, this community is hurting, and artists are hurting, and it's, it's a tough, <coughs> tough time. So what we want to do in this conversation is really uh, ask these guys to do some big thinking and um, take a look from 10,000 feet at where they are in terms of their perspective as artists, as innovators, if people have been a big uh, part of the industry for a long time. Uh, David, in terms of somebody who's been deeply involved in policy conversations for a long time and now working kind of on the public interest side of things. And start with this basic question is, is what does that balance mean to you? You know, can we strike that balance? Is that balance being struck? Uh, where are we? Where do we need to go? And they're going to solve all this in about 25 minutes, and then we'll move on. So we're going to start, and actually I'm going to make Erin go first because this is her fourth summit. And um, and and uh, Aaron, we're we're thrilled to say is, is now on the Future Music Board and and has been able to think about these issues uh, from uh, a lot of different perspectives. So I'm going to first ask Aaron, where are we? Where are we going? How are you feeling? What do we got to do? Thank you so much, Michael, for asking me to begin. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. I'm Aaron McKeown. Uh, I am a musician, writer, and producer, as Michael said. Uh, uh, now on the FMC board and um, happy to be here this morning talking about this. Um, j just to start out with, with where we're at, you know, I'm a musician who has, um, you know, my first record came out in 1999 and I was on several, you know, mini majors and now I'm all the way at the point of running my own label and also self-managed and managing, you know, a team of 10 people who are getting ready to put out my next record. So I've, I've sort of run the gamut in the last, uh, 12 something years of uh, being a musician in, in this space. Um, where we're at right now is for me, I, honestly, like this is the most exciting point that I've ever been at in my career with the potential to do a lot more things and to have a lot more choices. Um, I think the, the most important thing for me right now is that um, technology is offering me this way to, to play a number of roles that weren't available to me before. Um, as a sound recording owner, um, having more control over my songwriting copyright, um, having more control over my relationship with my fans. Um, those are all things that are really important to me that were not available to me many years ago. And um, so I find that really exciting that those things are, are, are basically available to me right now. Um, I also get to participate more in these type of discussions than I was able to before, and um, I, it's very important to me to be organizing more artists, and I am organizing more artists with the help of a lot of other people. We're starting to have more conversations about this and be more involved in this, which, as Michael said, is very, very, very important as we move forward. And, um, you know, <coughs> other than that, uh, just to, to throw out where I want to start with is that I have an opportunity. I, I, my rights are, are laid out for me, and, and what I really want is to have the choice of what to do with those rights. And that's, there's many different solutions to that, but for me as an artist, that's the bottom line, is I want to have the opportunity to deploy, use, give up, enforce my rights however I choose. So I'll start there. That's awesome. Um, I'm going to turn to Nashville, and, and John, I'm going to ask you kind of the same question. Where are we? Where do we need to be going? Um, how are we striking that balance? How do we need to strike that balance from your perspective? Thanks, Michael. Uh, well, it, really, uh, I think that's a good segue from Aaron because, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a music business attorney. I, I, re I represent almost exclusively artists in the, in the music work I do. And um, I'm, I'm also a former professional musician. <laughs> I can... Me and Tim both, right? So, uh, <laughs> I, I um, you know, it's it is an incredibly exciting time, and and the time that I was uh, active, you know, working as a as a musician professionally, I still play music, but when I was doing it for a living, it was <clears throat> back in the '90s, and and much of what pushed me in this direction of of getting involved in on the legal side and, and you know working for artists and in policy was frustration with the way the industry was then, and I do think we're in an incredibly exciting time right now, and I think there are, you know, many, many issues to work out. But the, we're we're finally starting to see this this digital ecosystem develop. And I, I started practicing law in 2004, and um, 
that was that was sort of the moment when everyone was panicking about you know are, are we in a situation where you know recorded music is no longer going to be economically viable on any level and that was a real possibility it seemed like and now we're starting to see that you know that's probably not going to happen you know there, there's you know digital streaming is is starting to really develop and is bringing with it many many issues and you know, I, I got together last last spring at South by Southwest with with some of my favorite people in the industry, some of the the, the you know thinkers I, I most respect, like Burtis Downs and, and Ed Pearson, and uh, you know we we wanted to understand you know the the revenue model that was developing, especially with respect to Spotify, and so we spent some time really digging into some of the statements from from you know some of, some of the bigger artists that we work with, and. It was generally pretty encouraging, you know. We we saw that that with the sort of scale that's that's starting to develop in, in the digital space, that you know that, that some of these artists were starting to make a pretty significant amount of money. And I have conversations with you know some of the some of the uh, you know younger artists that I work with, some of the real developing artists, where they're you know sort of freaking out because you know saying is there is there really any money in this digital space? And and the short answer is sure. Uh, but there are also many, many things to work out in terms of of, of policy. You know, this this uh, the Internet Radio Fairness Act is is a uh, you know is, is a really interesting debate around that, which which I'm trying very hard personally to understand. Um, and you know, I think we're in a moment where, in the artist community, and I consider myself part of the artist community, both as an artist and as an advocate. We really start need to, need to ask the, the difficult questions about transparency and about the revenue model, with with the I think reasonable expectation that you know the, the model going forward is going to be heavily dominated by digital streaming. So that's really where my attention is focused right now on a, on the policy side, and you know, and that's that's why I think it's amazing that that you know we have these conversations. And this is, by the way, the tenth year that I've been involved with Future Music. So. I think my first one was 2002, and, and over the course of that, it's been an incredible evolution. And I, I also want to say that, that the things we're starting to see become reality now in, in, in terms of the, the digital ecosystem. We were talking about that then. You know, this was all something that, that you know, people who were, who were involved in F, FMC then and now were, were definitely discussing as, as sort of, you know, abstract possibilities. So it's, it's thrilling to see it all come together, but it's also, you know, I think presents a real challenge. Yeah, Maggie, I'm going to turn to you and, and maybe talk a little bit about what you're doing uh, at Cash. And we're going to have a presentation later today from yes. Cash, so we don't need to get in the weeds on that. No. But just give a. <laughs> I'll let Jesse do that. Yeah, Jesse can get in the weeds. But the, um, you know, just reference that in, in, in terms of uh, what you're developing and how you got to that point and, and kind of how you see this balance uh, evolving. Okay. Um, I am one of the co-executive directors of Cash Music. Uh, we are a nonprofit that is building a platform of open source tools for artists to use for free. We don't take a percentage. Um, it's going to be the sort of the most baseline music technology, um, downloads, streaming, all sorts of things like that. Um, we are also working on an educational component of um, Cash Music, and, and we are building up a membership of artists right now. We have about 250 or so. Um, and we will tackle all sorts of issues like licensing, like publishing, um, helping artists understand a little better um, how to make the most out of these small streams of income um, <laughs> coming from all directions. But I have been in the music industry for over 18 years now or something. Um, I started when I was 19 at Kill Rockstars, um, the independent record label from Olympia, Washington. Um, I left there last summer um, and started working on cash full time. I've also been a musician for about 20 years, um, never full time, but it is um, something that's really important to me. My whole view of how we, or where we stand right now, um, it is a really interesting time. It is really exciting. I, I love that there are more avenues for artists to self-release. I love that there are more avenues um, for artists to take control of their lives. But I do have a real problem with this idea that the future is streaming because it doesn't work for everybody. Art doesn't always scale. And what happens to those people? Um, how are we going to help the shoe shoes of the world who are very important musicians who are never going to scale massively on Spotify or Pandora or whatever? Um, I think that thinking about art 
can be really, you know, art and commerce is a strange intersection, um, but I think it's important for us to remember the art aspect. Thanks. And David, I'm going to pull you in uh, on the policy side. I mean, I think one of the, the questions here, and obviously the complexity and kind of what's at the heart of future music, is that we are dealing with this incredibly complicated set of circumstances. We're looking at evolving technology and innovation on one side. You're looking at evolving markets and kind of consumer behavior at the other. You're looking at how art and culture fits into all this. And, you know, the big question in terms of, of our conversation today is then what does Washington do? You know, specifically around these kind of technology issues and some of the things that have been debated around IP enforcement and, um, you know, net neutrality and all the other kind of tech-related, you know, conversations that are happening. So, you know, what are you worried about or what are you excited about? What do you see happening and, and can you fit this together in terms of what you're hearing in terms of the music side? Sure. So, I'll, uh, <clears throat> first, I want to apologize for the squeaky voice. I hope it's still audible. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I work for the Center for Democracy and Technology, CDT. We're a nonprofit public interest group that focuses on law and technology issues. And that really starts from the proposition that the internet is a fundamentally democratizing technology. It creates new opportunities for free expression, for economic growth, for collaboration, for everyone, including certainly for artists. Uh, but in order to play that role, we think it needs to have the right kind of policy environment. And that's what my organization works to promote, a policy environment that will be favorable to the growth of the Internet and to innovation and to free expression online. So we work on a variety of issues, but I think the couple that are, are most relevant to, to the music, um, to, to both artists and the music industry, our, our, our copyright and net neutrality, and those are a couple of the issues that I've focused on during my time at CDT. Um, starting out with net neutrality, I mean, that's, that's important because it really determines how open and friendly the Internet is going to be to new services, new business models, new ways of distributing music. And you simply, you simply can't have the Internet democratize opportunity if a handful of small ISPs basically have a chokehold on everything because they get to decide which services are going to succeed and which services aren't. So, you know, I think that's a big issue. It's one where, in terms of where we stand today, it's kind of in a, in a weird limbo situation right now. The Federal Communications Commission, after lots of debate, put out for the first time some, some fully binding rules. Uh, they, those rules took effect about a year ago but they're now being challenged in court. So uh, everything is kind of awaiting that court case. Um, in Congress, that issue has unfortunately gotten sucked into the general dynamics of partisanship. So, uh, you know, I think for, for, for internet neutrality, um, the forecast is basically just ongoing gridlock and stalemate uh, in Congress. So that's why it really rests, the, the status of where things are today really rests on the court case and the agency rules. Uh, so second issue I work on that I think is relevant here is, is copyright and copyright enforcement. And from a high level, the, the trick there is that the same technology that creates all of these democratizing opportunities it also makes it possible for people to engage in large-scale infringement. But since it's the same technology that we're talking about, whatever strategies we decide on for enforcement, we need to be very careful that we don't end up targeting technology or, or technological solutions that are going to essentially throw the baby out with the bathwater by, by um, undermining the technology's positive potential as well as its infringement potential. And that's what was really at stake in the debate last year over PIPA and SOPA. Um, the supporters of, of, of those bills, I, I, I heard them say in a number of debates, well, there's no First Amendment right to infringe, so clearly there's no First Amendment problem here. And while there certainly isn't a First Amendment right to infringe, I think it really misses the point of what was at stake in those bills. Those bills... Uh, messed with the Internet's technical architecture. They messed with the social networks and kind of online sharing platforms and the ability of innovators to build new ones. And that's really why that was a big concern. I think where we are today on copyright after the defeat of those bills, um, we're, again, we're in kind of a funny place. Those bills amounted to something of, a, I, th I think, a, a hard reset for copyright policy. 
Um, but I think the lesson coming out of them for policymakers is that they need to be much more sensitive to the risk of collateral damage from copyright enforcement policies. Uh, if they aren't, and, 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 and I should say that that's an issue for Congress, but not only for Congress, from the law enforcement side too, you've seen cases like um, where the, the law enforcement authorities seized the domain names of music blogs and held them for over a year uh, without even telling them why, and then it took over a year for them to finally hand back the domain name and say, oops, sorry, um, you can have it back. Uh, and when you see abuses like that, it really, it really fosters an impression that the, the law enforcement authorities in this area and the policymakers in this area are not sensitive to the collateral damage that they cause. And I think that, in turn, creates a real risk of undermining respect for copyright generally, which ought to be of huge concern to artists, to copyright enforcers, and to everyone in this field. So I think going forward, we need to do a much better job of that. Thanks, David. And Thanks. Something, you know, I want to flag, which, you know, again, we, we, um, we always have the sense of deja vu at these conferences because we've been doing it for so blankety blank long. But the, the one point I, I want to stress again is uh, competition policy. And, you know, we've said this for 12 years. Is, you know, one of the core underlying infrastructure challenges is, you know, the fact that people are willing to pay you know, there's stuff that we, we, we all pay as consumers, or those who have the economic means will pay for as consumers. We'll pay our $100 data plan. We'll pay our ISP fees. We'll get our iPhone 4. We'll get our Galaxy 3. We'll pay for this stuff. And that creates tremendous economic pressure. And, and the fact that these prices are so high is a policy issue. It's about duopolies. It's about, you know, the government and their kind of oversight of our basic telecom infrastructure. And that's why FMC has fought that from the beginning, not only in terms of neutrality and preserving in, um, innovation, but in terms of AT&T T-Mobile merger, in terms of a lot of the issues that we've worked on. And one thing I would love to see, and, and I hope that we can see moving forward, is a kind of renewed engagement from the broader music community around these economic issues. That if we have more access to, more ubiquitous access to uh, better broadband at cheaper prices, that has fundamental economic uh, impact on consumers and consumers' opportunities to put more money not only into the music community but into you know, other areas. Um, so I'm at a loss because our schedule is way too packed today. So I, we're going to run a little bit late. And you know, frankly, I wish we could just have you guys for like three hours. Um, but as most of you know, we've taken a three-day conference. We're compressing it down to a day. I'm going to see if anybody has any questions, comments, feedback. Um, or Maggie, or any of you guys want to jump in and just respond to what you heard. We're going to go for about four or five more minutes, if that's all right. Kevin, somebody? <laughs> it's back here. The mic is back here. If anybody has questions, comments, reactions, panelists, if you have anything you want to say. Uh, Strom, real quick, I would like to put you on the spot. Yes. If you don't mind. Yeah, um, I have something I want to say about Maggie's comments, but go ahead. I thought you might. Why don't you respond to Maggie? And I would be curious if you would be comfortable of talking with some specificity. Um, I, I think a lot of the folks who are watching today may not be aware of some of the artists that you work with. And I think there's some amazing kind of case studies as far as what's happened, particularly over the last um, 18 months or so, in yeah, terms of I'll how this stuff is all coming I'll together. I'll this really quick. You know, I, 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 um, you know, my own background, I used to play in the band The Lemonhead. So, so I, I, you know, had a a real sort of uh, look look at professional music back then. Now my own clientele is is mostly independent artists, some of whom are, are fairly successful. I work with Bon Iver and the Civil Wars and, and Dawes and, and um, Alabama Shakes and Toro y Moi. So so these are independent label artists who've who've achieved a measure of success and, and you know are sustaining real professional careers. And you know, the, the one thing that, that most, if not all, of my clients have in common is that, you know, there's sort of art first, commerce second. And a lot of our role as the business team is to figure out how to make this creative work, which, you know, the integrity of the work is non-negotiable, work in commerce, you know, and provide a livelihood. And what Maggie said about art not scaling, I think, is really true. And, uh, you know, and, and I think for most of these artists that Maggie works with and that I work with, you know, the art side of it is... is, is of paramount importance. You know, the, the one thing that I'm interested in when I ran models based on, you know, likely growth of, you know, Spotify or similar services, you know, I've, 
and, and certainly looking at my own catalog of, of tiny and significant releases I own and control and seeing the, the growth there, you know, I think there's a real possibility that as the, as the scaling, uh, as, the, as, the, as the streaming ecosystem really starts to scale, we're going to see a lot more revenue coming to the smaller artists, you know, and, and you know, for the larger artists we're going to be dealing with, you know, hundreds of millions or billions of, of, of uh, performances. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited about that possibility, but very nervous about, you know, uh, how it's going to shake out for artists and, and, you know, very focused on the many questions that raises. And, and this, of course, is something we've been working on at FMC for the last couple of years in terms of the Artist Revenue Stream Research Project and really trying to get some real data and metrics around how the pie is, is starting to evolve and, you know, the 42 distinct revenue streams that artists are having now. Gene Cook will be presenting on that later today. Oh, we're going to do a quick question and then, um, thank you. So, and I'm in agreement with the whole idea that art's got a count in this and that streaming, you know, everybody's kind of a little dubious about that. Um, so, the idea of this middle class, artist middle class that Westergren raised, you know, as a possibility through streaming services, um, you don't think that's a reality? And secondly, how can we get there if not? What, what besides streaming are the options for these art I, first I artists? I think it'll be streaming alone. I think streaming probably will be an important piece of it, for sure. Um, but I think ultimately, my wish and my dream, and you know, maybe that's what it is, is that by enabling artists to direct connectly with their fans, they can encourage sales. Um, I mean, we're all willing to pay, or not we are, I'm not, but lots of people are willing to pay $5 for their cup of coffee, their fancy cup of coffee every day. But they balk at paying $10 to an artist for their favorite record that they might listen to, you know, dozens or hundreds of times. Um, that, that's just not even considered normal um, for a whole generation of, of kids. Um, and I feel like part of that is the narrative that the music industry is terrible and that there's nothing fair about it, and so why even try? Um, part of it is just sort of a generational thing. But, you know, we've all, we all learn, we all relearn things. We all learn to to respect and um, appreciate things that maybe could be free. You know, uh, NPR works, public radio. If, if there was a direct connection that people felt to their, f to their favorite bands, maybe they'd be more willing to, you know, buy an album or even give them a tip, you know, just some sort of more <laughs> significant piece of income versus, you know, 0 .004 cents per stream. Or can, can I can I comment on that real quick? <laughs> let, let Aaron go first, John. Oh, go ahead. Yes. Sorry, John. Couldn't no see problem. Um, I just want to jump in with Maggie and and also to answer Greg's question. Um, I, I the, the the how to create this middle class, which um, you know has been raised before Tim Westergren was raised it this morning. Um, but this idea that um, m multiple roles, I think, and multiple streams are going to be really important. Like again, as I began saying, I'm a copyright owner, I'm a sound recording owner, I'm a touring artist. Like multiple roles, um, and and also this idea that Maggie's talking about. I like when I talk about this stuff. I like to talk about food. I like to talk about the success of the local food movement. And I like to talk about the way that in the last, you know, p p pick, a, pick a number five years, ten years, you can look at it. And, um, and we've seen a real change in who's participating in our food system, both in who's growing it and who's eating things and a conversation about food. And people are totally willing to pay. Uh, you use the example of coffee, but, you know, let's use the example of like a CSA. People are willing to pay for that because there's been a conversation about what benefits that and the part of the tiny ecosystem that that's part of. So I, I think that's part of the solution. And um, I'll just say this last thing, which is that I, I'm actually really tired of being told that things are going to scale. Um, I'm just tired of being told that. I haven't seen it. It doesn't feel like it. I think, you know, my retweet from the conference is, you know, art doesn't always scale. Um, but again, I just want to come back to talking about relationships, talking about conversations, and talking about, like, small economies uh, in between people um, that aren't necessarily about monetization, I think, is the, the, the many-fold answer to this question. John, do you want to say something? Hey, Greg Cott. <laughs> um, I, 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 I do indeed. Um, yeah, I think, I think those are all fantastic points and, um, and, and completely valid. And that, that argument resonates with me. I'm hearing a weird echo. Um, Did we lose Strom? 
a lot of we need better infrastructure. What's what's going on? I'm hearing weird stuff. Okay. Uh, Am I still on? Yes, you are. Okay, cool. Uh, a lot of the challenge is, is bringing people who you know won't pay under any circumstances into the into the um, into the um, economy somehow. You know, getting them, you know, moving them to some service where there's there's somehow revenue generating, and you know, and that, at that point, it's about competing with free. And I think if if I could harken back for a moment to that to that you know. You know, widely, you know, sort of discussed uh, Emily White um, article for, from earlier in the year. Uh, you know, the, the point that she made at the end is she said, hey, look, our generation, you know, we're not willing to pay for anything, but we will pay something for total access to everything all the time, which is, you know, it's disturbing on some level, but there's also a lesson in there, which is, you know, for the people who have no intention of ever paying for recorded music again, if there's a way to bring them into the economy somehow, then, then that could be a win. And, you know, I think on the one extreme, there are the true fans who are willing to pay for product, willing to pay for you know, for the for the experience and the connection to their to their favorite artists, but that's a I think that's a fairly thin uh, sliver of the of the entire uh, market. You know, and then there's a big piece of the market that just have no intention to pay ever again. And, and you know, part of the challenge is somehow bringing them into it. And I think you do that by successfully competing with free by offering alternatives that are superior to the free option. Thanks, John. Uh, I hate to say we are absolutely over time already. Um, so I apologize for having to make this such a compressed conversation because I think you all have a lot more to add and hopefully this is just a beginning. And uh, I know we're going to unpack a lot of these issues uh, throughout the day and on an ongoing basis through our own collective dialogues. Thank you so much, panelists. Thank you, John, for participating. Thanks. And um, next we're going to have uh, Daniel Raymer.